Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa lahma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It's nice to see uh, so many people here alhamdulillah We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he uh, makes us among those who learn beneficial knowledge and that he makes us among those who benefit from that which they learn Allahumma ameen um, if anybody wants to sit down in these chairs or to take one of these chairs, you can. You don't have to, you don't have to stand or sit on the floor if you don't need to, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, we will um, begin tonight with a discussion on the differences between the Mecca and uh, Medani verses. So we talked about the general verses and the specific verses, right? We said that any verse that's actually general, even if it was revealed for a specific purpose, is actually meant to be general as well. That there are only very few instances where the verses are meant to be kept as um, uh, specific. And usually those were discussing the Prophet ﷺ himself and some of the things that he is regarding. طيب. So for Mecca and Madani, these two words um, refer to what? Yeah, so they refer to Mecca and Medina, right? So, question number one. Does this refer to a place or a time? It refers to time, not place. Both place and time? <laughs> yes. So, it's referring to the verses that were revealed uh, uh, either before the Hijrah, before the migration, and then after the migration, uh, he went to Medina. So obviously there's an element of, of, of place there because he went from one place to another. But the more important criteria is actually the time. And, and how do we know this? That it's actually more specifically time than it is place. There were verses that were revealed, for example, in Surah Al-Fatih. Right? Surah Al-Fatih uh, discusses the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. Now where is Hudaybiyah? It's right outside Mecca. In fact, nowadays it's considered a suburb of Mecca. <laughs> okay? Because it's included into the city. Um, however, at the time, so this, now those verses, when we recite them, are they considered Medani or Mecca? Okay. Now? Yes, yeah, so what I'm asking you guys. Lahda, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that one. Right now we're talking about Surah Al Fatih. The con I'm sorry, Surah Al Fatih, which is. Yani, the, the, the title means the victory. But it was in Sulh al Hudaybiyah. It was in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which is the sixth year of Al Hijrah. So it's six years after the Hijrah, but it's right there in Mecca. Where was it revealed? What, what do we consider it? It is Madani. It's Madani. So anything revealed after the Hijrah, regardless of where, is considered Madani. Even if it was revealed in the outskirts of Medina, and there's even a more yeah, a specific one, which is the verse, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. The verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah says, Today we have perfected for you your religion. Where was this revealed? Where in Mecca? Good, yes, yes. Excellent. It was revealed in, in Arafah, right? So how do we know this? The... Uh, Umar ibn Khattab, anhu, this story is mentioned in many of the books, and then the, the actual matan is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, right? But this part is mentioned in some other books, I believe. A Jewish man comes to Umar, a Jewish man living in Medina, and he comes to Umar ibn Khattab, عنه, and he says, Umar, oh Umar, I've heard some Muslims recite this verse, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. Today we have completed, or today we have perfected for you religion. Usually means complete, meaning today the religion, khalas, it's set, this is the religion now, completely. And I have perfected, I have finished my ni'mah upon you, my blessing, which is Islam itself. Uh, and I have now been pleased with Islam as a religion or as a way of life for you. Look how beautiful this verse is. Allah is mentioning Islam as a, as a blessing. He's saying that He's completed the religion, that's it, it's set today. It's never going to change from this day on, etc., etc. So this Jewish man, being an intelligent man, he said, Oh, Umar, if us Jews had a similar verse, we would celebrate this day. This would be a day of Eid for us. This would be a day that we never forget. This, is, this would be the day that we, we hold on to very tightly. You know what Umar said? We already celebrate it. We already have it as Eid. 
He says, indeed, I know when it was revealed and where it was revealed. And he says it was revealed in Arafah on the day of Friday when the Prophet ﷺ was giving the khutbah on that day. The khutbah of Arafah in Masjid Namira. Right? And to this day, we know that the day of Arafah is the best of days. Huh? Many reasons why. And one of the reasons is this verse here. Because it was revealed on that day that the Prophet ﷺ made Hajj. Khalas, Islam is now complete. Now this is revealed in the heart in, in, in Mecca, but it's still considered what type of verse? It's a Madani verse. Does that make sense? So Madani in Mecca refers to time, not place. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, the door of ishtihad is done. The door of ishtihad is done, is closed. No more ishtihad. No, we have to do ishtihad. Fatawa are in ishtihad issues, not in set issues. I think the quote that you're referring to is the quote of Imam Malik. Rahimahullah. Imam Malik, when he saw people do some innovations in the religion, they were changing some elements. He said, We have to follow. Islam as it was originally revealed and the way that the Sahaba practiced it. Why? Because he says, this verse says, whatever was not part of the religion on that day will never be part of the religion. Whatever was not part of the religion on that day is not part of the religion. This does not mean a person cannot make ijtihad. In fact, we do need ijtihad. But there are dawabat, and the dawabat have to follow the religion anyways. There are dawabat meaning criteria, there's a process, there's a procedure. And this is all specified in Islam. And we know what that procedure is because the Prophet ﷺ himself mentioned it to uh, uh, Mu'adh and to other of the Sahaba when he sent them to Yemen. He says, Bima tahkum? How are you going to rule? He says, Bi kitabillah, by the book of Allah. Fa'illam tajid fi kitabillah, fa bi sunnati Rasulillah. He says, If you don't find it in the book of Allah, how are you going to rule? He says, According to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Taib, if you don't find it in the Sunnah, how are you going to rule? He says, Ajtahidur ra'i, wala alwu. He says, I will try my best. And I will not deviate, meaning from the principles, the core principles of Islam that every Muslim should know. And then of course he taps him, or he doesn't tap him, he actually like pounds his chest. Uh, and then he says, لِيَهْنَكَ الْعِلْمِ He says, may Allah bless your knowledge. Yani, or beautify it, or yani, mashallah. Yani, he's praising Mu'adh for knowing how the process for ijtihad is actually done. Okay, And that's the whole point. So ijtihad, ijtihad the door of ijtihad inshallah ta'ala is still open. That's not a problem. Okay? So we said Umar knows when this was revealed. Perfect. Tayyib, the next slide. We have Mecca and Madani. There are differences. So why is it? It's not just about time. Time is very important, obviously, in this. But it's not just about time. There are other elements. And these are very basic. There's actually ones, scholars have written whole books just on Mecca and Madani. This is a basic summary just to get some ideas about the differences. And by the way, after knowing these differences, you can open up almost any verse in the Quran and you can immediately tell this is Mecca, this is Madani. Now, there are differences of opinions amongst the scholars on certain ayat in the Quran, whether they're Madani or Mecca. And the discussion is because there's a lack of textual evidence, yani a lack of adilla, or that there are two different dalils and they both could be correct. And a lot of these verses were either revealed right at the end of the Meccan period or right in the beginning of the Madani period. Meaning nobody will disagree on a verse that was revealed at the end of the Madani period towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, because most of the Sahaba knew when those were revealed. But there are ones, and so sometimes you'll read and they say, well this surah was actually revealed half here, half there. Or this verse was revealed actually on the way, on the journey. And there are some examples like this. But overall, just knowing the stylistic differences and the thematic differences and the other differences that there exist, you can immediately tell where this verse was or when this verse was revealed. So first we're going to discuss some stylistic differences. The first is hardness versus harshness versus softness. Harshness versus softness. Which one do you think is more harsh? Which one do you think is more soft? So Mecca is harsh. Why is it harsh? Yeah. 
Yes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is harsh in the Meccan period. Okay, that's actually correct. Because He's trying to warn the disbelievers and to call them to attention. And because many of them turned away, that needs an element of harshness to bring them back. And it's softer. Uh, the verse is meaning in the way that it talks to people, the way that it addresses certain things. In the Madani period, why? Who was it talking to? Man al Mukhatab. Ayy believers. Why would Allah be harsh against the believers? Unless they need some harshness. So it doesn't mean that this is a rule all the time. There's a moment needed for harshness and there's a moment needed for softness. But overall, يَغْلِبْ الطَّابِعْ الْمَدَنِي الْلِينَ Lean softness and gentleness is actually very well evident in Madani verses. Madani verses tend to be more gentle. And the Meccan verses, because the, the people of Mecca were the rejectors. They rejected a lot of it. There was an element of harshness that is needed. Very good. Long versus short, or detailed versus brief. Which one is which? Mecca is short. Mecca is short, and Madani is long and detailed. Why is this needed? Yes, so legislation, if I need to specify the details on how to go to Hajj, or how to do your zakah, or who to pay your zakah to, right? Elements of worship. How do you go and approach your salah? The ayah of wudu, if you look at it, it's, it goes down six, seven lines in the page. One verse. And for Meccan verses, six, seven lines, that's a whole surah. That's two surahs, with each one being, you know what I mean, having 10 or 15 ayat, right? So, there's a huge difference in length, and there's a difference in the amount of detail. So Meccan verses tend to be lack of a lot of detail. They're very general in their descriptions. And they also use more eloquent language. Doesn't mean that the Medani verses are not eloquent, they're not beautiful. In fact, a lot of them are very beautiful, right? But the point is not to be beautiful. Whereas in the Meccan verses, Allah made a point to make it beautiful. Why? Exactly. In order to compete with them in their language, to compete with them in their eloquence. Because they used to pride themselves in the elements of poetry and command of language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a point to challenge them linguistically. Whereas in the Madani verses, that linguistic challenge is still there, but it's not as detailed. And it's not the point of the verses. The point of the verses is now legislation and other things. Sah tashriya. Okay? Madani verses are, 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 are big on detail. Um, they're long-winded, right? Um, they tend to be huge. And you can look at examples of all of these. So harshness versus softness. You can read Surah Al-Muddathir and see how Allah was harsh against uh, 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 Al-Walid, right? And the one who rejected. When he heard the verses of the Qur'an and then he started thinking, إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرَ فَقُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ ثُمَّ قُتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرْ ثُمَّ يعني So his, Allah Azza wa Jalla is talking about his, this own person's يعني, uh, thought process and how he wanted to attack the Qur'an and why he attacked it even though he knew it was the truth, even though he knew there was no way that a man could come up with this. All of these things. There's an element of harshness there. Right? Surah Al-Qamar. You read Surah Al-Qamar and it has, يعني, it's terrifying. I remember one time there was a brother who came and he's like, brother, this surah is like intense. I was like, which one? He's like, I was listening to it in my, in my car and he was listening to the Arabic and then they translate the verse in English, right? Arabic and then translate the verse in English. He's like, let me find you the name and come. So I was confused. I'm thinking about, man, what surah? He's like, it's absolutely terrifying. I stopped playing it. And when he came back, he said it's Surah Al-Qamar, the, the chapter of, yani, that talks about the moon, the splitting of the moon. Now when you read it, the translation, it first opens up talking about the disbelievers at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the disbelievers of the people of Noah and how Allah destroyed them. Then the people of Ad and how Allah destroyed them. Then the people of Thamud and how Allah destroyed them. Then the people of Lut and how Allah destroyed them. Then the people of Fir'aun and how Allah destroyed them. And then there's a harsh warning against the people of Quraysh where he says, سَيُهْجَمُ الْجَمْعُ وَيُوَلُّونَ الدُّبُرُ بَلِ السَّاعَةُ مَوْعِدُهُمُ السَّاعَةُ أَدْهَى وَأَمَر Allah is warning them. All of this within two and a half pages. Yeah, and it's, it's one after another, after another, extremely harsh, right? Because Allah Azza was warning them. Prophet Sallallahu in a weak hadith says, Shayabatni Hud wa akhawatiha. Hud give me shape, yeah, and it gave me gray hair. And the Prophet didn't have gray hair, by the way, he just had a few, 
Yani they counted them, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they counted how many gray hairs that the Prophet had. But in this week narration it says that he got those just from reading these chapters of the Quran in which Allah is talking about destroying previous nations. All of these are Meccan surahs. The Madani surahs, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to believers, He's talking to Muslims, they need a different way to talk to. Unfortunately today when us Muslims we deal with one another, we're harsh to one another, and then with non-Muslims who have rejected us, we're nice. Right? And we're, we're soft and calm and whatnot. And this is, yani, subhanAllah, there's a little wisdom here that we need to actually be more accommodating to one another, especially as Muslims and not be as harsh. Right? In order to yani, keep each other steadfast. And like we said, the detail, yani, any surah, you take any madani surah and read the amount of detail. Surah Al-Ma'idah. The verses are huge. Look at Ayat Al-Dayn. The verse of debt. The verse of taking a loan. How long is it? It's an entire page. In the Mus'haf, this one, you know, the one that's printed uh, 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 in Medina, uh, a whole page, one verse. It's actually not that hard to memorize because it's very well detailed and it follows a logical sequence. Where a lot of actually people have a harder time memorizing Meccan surahs because the eloquence gets lost on a lot of people and you start to lose track of where I am and all these things. Where these long surahs that detail transactions and how to do, and it starts going into all these details. What's beautiful about that verse is that at the very end, Allah says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ At the very end. He says, if you fear Allah, Allah will teach you. Meaning Allah, all of this is meant to just teach you how to properly do business. How to properly take a loan, how to properly give somebody money and then take it and so on and so forth. It's a simple process. Okay? We're still on Makki and Madani. Thematic differences. Themes are the big topics, the message that we're trying to derive from these verse. Right? One deals primarily with aqidah, belief in Allah Azza wa belief in the hereafter, the resurrection, the recompense, which is the account, al hisab. Talks about paradise and the hellfire. Sah? Which one is this? Makki. Okay? So the other one deals with details on acts of worship, details on transactions, agreements, political life. Battles, hypocrisy, marriage, divorce, all these types of things are detailed where? Madani. What about stories of the prophets? It's actually both. <laughs> some were sent before, some were sent. Now most of them were sent where? In Mecca, right before in the Mecca period. There was one particular story that was revealed in Medina. A lot of details of it. Who can guess? No, Dhul Qarnayn Kahf was in uh, Medina. I'm sorry, Mecca. Yeah, the story of Isa alayhi salam. And some of the stories of Musa, yes. So Isa alayhi salam, a lot of details of him came in Medina. Why? In Surah Al Imran specifically. Exactly. Because the Prophet sallam, was now debating with Christians. And there were details that were needed to discuss, especially from the life of Isa alayhi salam, in order to discuss with them. So a lot of, not all of you, I mean, we can't say the stories of the, of the prophets were all revealed in Mecca. No, this is incorrect. Actually, some of them were revealed in Medina, and specifically like Isa ibn Maryam, and some details of Musa alayhi salam as well. Right? Because of the need now. Musa alayhi salam, part of his struggle was political, and the Prophet sallam also had um, some elements of that as well. So these are some thematic differences. Also in the theme, one in its address, addresses issues that are relating to all of mankind, and one is specifically for the believers only. The one that's with mankind is Mecca, the Mecca period, the Mecca verses, and the Madani verses are almost always going to deal with the believers themselves. So if I see a verse in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, most likely, not always, most likely, where was this revealed? In Mecca. Right? What's an exception to this? Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed in Medina, yet the first Amr in Surah Al-Baqarah is, Ya ayyuhan nasu abudu rabbakum. O mankind. So it's not, it's not all, the, all the time, but most of the time it is Mecca, Mecca verses, where it says, O mankind. Okay? When it says, Ya ayyuhan ladina amanu, this one all the time is where? In Medina. Ya Yuladina Amanu, this is automatically a Madani verse. 
And this difference was not lost on many of the scholars of Islam, which is why we didn't have this division, by the way, of Mecca and Madani at the time of the Sahaba. But later on, they started to see that there's now a, a clear split in how Allah is addressing the people that are meant by the Qur'an. And then that's how we can draw now this line, it becomes clear and all these things. Okay? Tayyib, we'll continue. What are the benefits of studying and knowing this? Like I said, these details were not lost on many of the scholars. So then why is it important to us to know these differences? Yes, so it actually puts things into a historical context. Like we said before, our religion cannot be separated from its history. Meaning our history is intimately related to the theology, either the history in the seerah itself, or even in the four Khulafa al-Rashidin, or even after them as well. And our religion has an intimate tie to its history as well. So this is one reason. We as people get to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses different people differently, according to who that person is, and his reaction to the Qur'an, and their understanding of the world around them. By the way, this persists until now in 2017. Sah? What do we mean by this? We mean that now, and yani there's this whole discussion on the scientific miracles of the Qur'an. And I've mentioned this before where we can't really use that word. The usage of this word miracle means that the science is not changing, the science is absolute, that the science is now at the same level of the Qur'an and this is impossible. Also, we reject this from a theological point of view. That anything can be at the same level of the Qur'an. However, this does not negate that there are scientific references in the Qur'an that the language of the Qur'an accommodates. What we mean by this is that if yani, the verse that says, وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدًا وَهَا تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ You look at the mountains and you think that they are solid, that they are there, but they move just like the clouds move. Meaning in a way that's subtle and you can't even feel it, you don't even know that it actually moves. Now the Sahaba read this, they didn't understand what it meant, but they accepted it. They're like, Khalas, Allah says that they move, they move. Now people study tectonic plates and all these things, and then they realize that there's actually a movement that we do not know. Whether it's referring to the movement of the earth as a whole, or the actual plates, whatever it is. Can we say that this is a miracle? No, we can't. Because a miracle by definition has to be very clear, it has to be elaborate. People after rejecting it must then be punished. There's a lot of things that are entailed, but it's a scientific reference. And it's an accommodation in the language so that an Arab in the 7th century can understand this verse and accept it. And now a person in 2017, right, who understands tectonic plates can also appreciate this verse in new light. That's the miracle. The miracle is that. It's not the, the, the scientific reference of it. It's the accommodation of everybody within the same book. Do you guys understand the difference here? And this is actually what um, is meant by this. So that yani, the Qur'an, dividing into Mecca and Madani, has that ability in order to accommodate the kuffar being referred to, the believers being referred to, all of mankind, etc. Go ahead. To challenge the human intellect? Yes, like uh, in the Hadith, Salawat, yes. All the challenging to human intellect. Exactly, yes. It's meant for people to reflect on the verses. Obviously, I mean, this, whole, this whole exercise is meant for us to reflect on the verses and not to just read them superficially and get it over with. No. Yeah. Another benefit is that it allows us to see wisdom in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually revealing His verses and gradually legislating certain things. At-tadarruj fi tashriya We see that in Mecca, were there any laws revealed? Very few. You can count them. And I remember when we did Surah Al-Mutaffifin, it says, وَيْنُ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ Al-Mutaffifin here are the people who, um, when they wanted some measurements, when they were giving people, they would put less, but then when they wanted, they wanted their full amount. They wanted people to be fair with them, but they didn't want to be fair with the people. Right? But they were doing this in their weights and measurements, but you can apply this to anything. Sah? This is obviously wrong and incorrect. You can't deal with people like this. That arguably could be a form of legislation, in the sense that Allah is telling them, you need to 
be wary of the way that you do business with one another. This verse was revealed in Mecca. However, some scholars say that it was revealed right at the end of the Meccan period. To give an alluding to the idea that, guess what, now you're going to transition into Madani life. Which is going to be completely different. Now you guys are going to run your own businesses. You're going to have your own society. There's going to be a way needed for us to deal and interact with one another. In this sense. Okay? So it shows wisdom in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually becoming more and more, revealing more laws. You know, certain things are now happening. Wudu is now being developed. Before, there were no rules on how to make wudu. And then gradually these things come up. Before the incidents that happened at the battle, after one of the battle, I think Ghazwat Dhat al-Salasil, and they were stuck in a place and there's no water. Right? They didn't have tayammum before this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verses of tayammum. Right? And so on and so forth. And we mentioned all of this before. It teaches us that there is a prioritization that takes place. What we mean by this is awlawiyat fi da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started revelation with belief in Allah, belief in the Creator, belief that the heavens and the earth have a designer for them, have somebody who maintains them and takes care of them, that you, O oh mankind, you also have a Creator, and that this Creator did not create you for nothing, He created you for a purpose. That's very different than a verse that tells you, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْعَامِلِينَ عَيْهَا and so on and so forth, right? A verse that says zakah should only be given to the following people and then one, two, and three, four, five. Very different. If you look, one is talking about a huge, big, yeah, a general issue and one is talking about very... And so this is a wisdom for us. When you go and give da'wah to a person who's non-Muslim, you're not going to say, hey, do you know anything about zakah? Let me tell you. So zakah can only be given, the person's not going to listen to you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And this is why we have to understand that just as Allah prioritized what to tell people in the beginning, we too have to do the same thing. We can't start with people in these difficult things. Even when we teach. So if we teach Islam to the kids and whatnot, we can't start with them on the very harsh things. And another day I got upset at the Islamic studies teacher for my son. And I, they were teaching them when you... Um, enter the bathroom, you need to enter with your left foot, and when you come out, you need to exit with your right foot, and then when you enter your house, you enter with your right foot, and when you leave, you exit with the left foot, and when you enter the masjid, my kid is confused. Six years old, he's like, I forgot, which one is it? Left foot or right foot, all these things. I'm like, look, while this is good, right? If you ask any one of these kids, tell me about Allah, they'll probably struggle to a certain extent. Tell me about Prophet Muhammad they'll probably struggle to a certain extent. Tell me why the feet even matter. Nobody could tell you. Sah? So this, I'm not negating that this is part of our religion. These are mustahabbat and makruhat. But mustahab should never be taken over something that's fard or something that's wajib, right? And something that's makruh shouldn't even be discussed when we haven't discussed something that's haram, a level worse, in which we know, we know that there is a punishment. And similarly, that's what Allah Azzajal cared about. In the beginning, the details of the religion, how to do things, He didn't even care about it at all. For 13 years, none of the details mattered. All that mattered was putting iman and faith in the heart. I met a guy who left Islam because of this. Okay? I was there when he accepted Islam, and I met him on the street four years later riding a bike, and I stopped my car, I got out, and I ran after him, and I'm yelling his name, and he looked at me, he's like, oh, wait, I remember you, you're from that mosque, you know, that's downtown, this is back when I was in Utah. I was like, what happened to you, man, I haven't seen you in a while, what happened to you? He's like, oh, I stopped going a long time ago. Why? I said, so are you still Muslim? I asked him, he's like, I think so. Alhamdulillah. think about that answer. You ask him, are you still Muslim? He's like, I think so. Why did you stop going? He's like, every time I went to the mosque, Somebody, now not our mosque, it was another mosque. And may Allah Azza guide them, they're nice brothers. I, mean, I hope yani, their intentions are pure. He said, every time I go to the mosque, somebody yells at me, Brother, you came in with your left foot. <laughs> okay. Brother, you went into the restroom with your right foot. Brother, when you were praying, you were doing this. Your hands were not exactly where they should have been. When you were doing this, he said, I kept on getting people either yelling at me or trying to pressure me. And I didn't even understand what I did wrong. He says, I left. I'm not going to go back there. Yeah. And the, unfortunately, and it, we're not negating that these are part of our religion, but these come after an understanding of what our religion is. 
when the kid can't tell you why we pray, you know what I mean? It's going to be hard for him to pray. So he has to understand who it is that you're praying for. Which is why in the beginning, salah wasn't legislated. If you think about it until al-Isra wal miraj And before this, salah was legislated in a very basic form. It is said that they only prayed two times a day, Fajr and Asr. That's it. Before this. And Qiyam layl they had to do it. And even then, yani, it, was very, it, was, it was completely different than the way that we pray now. Because that wasn't the focus. The focus is who it is that you believe in. How do you accept Him, etc., etc., etc. And so we have to apply this in our own lives, with our children, with who we have in our families, in our households, with how we deal with others as well. If we're giving da'wah to non-Muslims, we really have to apply this. And it's very sad that a new Muslim comes in and you'll find the brother giving him details on wudu that wallahi born Muslims don't know. And I've seen this. Brother, you have to wash and you have to get in between each toe and you have to make sure and you do this and you're three times. And, it has to, and the person is like, whoa, he's taking detailed notes. He has now a whole book on the fiqh of wudu that many born Muslims don't have, right? Uh, but then you ask him, you can ask that same non-Muslim, tell me what you got out of the prayer. How did you feel when you prayed? He's like, I don't know. I'm too focused on the details to even really focus in my prayer on who I'm praying to. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, the essence, the khushur, the khushur, which is the essence of the prayer, the focus, is not taught. We don't teach it. We don't tell the person, you need to have khushur in your salah. Really, how do I get khushur? You, you start talking to them. Who it is you're worshipping? Who are you yourself? What is your goal in life? What do you want to attain? What do you want to get out of the salah, etc., etc., etc.? But we focus on a lot of the details. Now, the details are important, but if you look, the details will come later. That's fine. Right now, just focus on God. Focus on the one that you believe in. You've accepted Islam for a reason. Focus on that. But we don't do that. طيب. The last one is an important concept for us, which is understanding al nasikh wal mansukh which is abrogation in the Qur'an. Meaning there are verses that are abrogated, we no longer apply the ruling of these verses. And there are verses that we continue to actually apply. If there are two verses that are contradictory, or one clearly abrogated the other, which one do we choose? Automatically. We pick the Madani one over the Makki one. If they're both Madani, then whichever one came later. Because of that verse, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم. Today we have perfected for your religion, meaning the religion was set in stone that day. Before that it's still fluid, there might be some change in the religion. But after that day, خلاص, it's set. There's no more change. So in ilm, in nasikh wal mansukh, madani will always take priority over Makki. And then the later madani will always be taken after the, uh, I'm sorry, before yani the, the, the earlier uh, Makki. So, why was the Qur'an revealed, revealed piecemeal, meaning in pieces, in sections, in verses at a time? Sometimes a whole surah, but most of the time it was verses at a time. What is the wisdom in this? So first we can get a wisdom from the Qur'an itself. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدَةً كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ وَرَتَّلْنَاهُ تَرْتِيلًا He says, and those who disbelieve say, why was the Qur'an not revealed to him all at once? Thus, that we may strengthen thereby your heart. And we have spaced it distinctly. So number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it's easier to memorize this way. This is to give you tathbeet in your heart. Which means that number one, it'll actually help maintain your iman. If he's meeting Jibreel on a regular basis, this is going to be great for his iman. Which is always why the graduality in learning is better than learning all at once. Learning little over time is better than learning a lot all at once. This is what this verse is clearly saying, number one. And then number two, it's also a reassurance for his iman. Think about it. If you're the Prophet Wasallam and you're meeting Jibreel, every time you meet Jibreel, automatically your iman is going to do what? It's going to go higher. We're not saying that the, the Prophet's iman was low, but we're saying that it is going to increase your iman. Every time us, as Muslims, we come to the masjid, our iman increases. Every time we sit in a good gathering, our iman is going to increase. And so when it's spaced out like this, it will help your iman. But if it was sent all at once, then you kind of struggle with, okay, what do I do with this other times as well? Okay? 
So we have to, and this is something very profound for us. This is why it's also best, if we ourselves want to memorize the Qur'an, to do it little by little is best. I remember yani, a friend of mine, he attended one of these uh, summer camps for memorizing Qur'an. He went overseas, came back three months later. Be- before he went, he only had like maybe five ajza memorized. When he came back, he's like, I finished the Qur'an. In three months, memori- memorized it. They were memorizing like eight, ten pages a day. MashaAllah. But then later on, within a year, he's like, I forgot it all. After the year. And I talked to him, I'm like, how, by the way, how's your... He's like, oh man, it's gone. What happened? He's like, I didn't maintain it. If there's no revision, it's gone. Like they say, easy come, easy go. But when you work on it, little by little, verse by verse, and you internalize it and memorize it, understand it, you can easily move on to the next. And this is the point. So even if it takes a person 23 years to memorize the Qur'an, because if you think about it, that's how long the Prophet ﷺ, it took him to memorize the Qur'an. Obviously, that's how long it took to be revealed to him, Aslan. But that's also how long it took him to memorize it. But that's why he internalizes it. Every verse, not only did he know it, but he understood it and he applied it to the full. This is why Umar ibn Khattab anhu, he says that whenever we learned the Qur'an, ما كنا نتجاوز العشر آيات And another version, خمس آيات. We never went past ten verses, another narration, five. Meaning, depending on the length of the verse. Except, yani we'd memorize and then we stop so that we know ما فيها من العلم وما فيها من العمل. What knowledge is contained in these verses and what actions can be contained in the verses. What can I do to apply these verses? I got it all, great, now I can move on. Teaching the Qur'an just to, as memorization defeats the whole purpose for the kids when they don't understand what they're reading. Now I'm not discouraging, go ahead and memorize, but it should go hand in hand with understanding. The other day I was asked to sub at the school for 6th graders and for some of the 8th graders and so I said you guys read Surah Al-Fatiha great let's start with Surah Al-Fatiha what do we say before we even begin reciting uh, one of the two of the kids are kind of confused one said A'udhu Bilaam Shalala Rajim perfect good A'udhu Bilaam Shalala Rajim who can tell me what this means out of both grades four kids knew what it meant <laughs> I was deeply disappointed now once we said it, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I think I heard that before somewhere. Shaitan, yeah, you're talking about shaitan, good. One kid told me, it means, go away, shaitan. <laughs> so I said, no, that's not what it means. And I'll actually clarify why that's actually incorrect. Because you're calling upon Allah, not shaitan. You shouldn't even deal with shaitan. You know, like Umar, عنه, he says, dealing with shaitan directly is like if you come upon a shepherd, and the shepherd has a shepherd dog. And the dog comes and bothers you. And you shoo the dog away, and the dog comes back. And you shoo the dog away, and the dog comes back. And you shoo the dog away, and the dog comes back. He says, this will never end. You'll always be in a fight with shaitan. This is why people who have waswasa, waswas, and shaitan always comes to them, either in their salah, or in their wudu, or whatever it is that they do, it's because they're battling shaitan directly. And Umar says, هذا يطول ولكن استعين برب الكلب he says, you should seek help in the Lord of that dog. Which in the scenario of the shepherd, the shepherd is the Lord of the dog, meaning he's the owner of the dog. So he says, go to the owner of shaitan. Who's shaitan's owner? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you seek refuge in Allah from the evil shaitan. You don't say, shaitan, go away. <laughs> you say, I seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. And Allah will protect you immediately. You get a layer of protection. And we talked about layers... The whole period, we didn't get past the Billah Shatar Rajim. Because that's how يعني, much it took. But hopefully they internalize it and they understand it and then we can move on. It's very sad when people recite Surah Al-Fatiha and they don't even know what it means. For years and years of their life. Right? So this verse says, in order to reassure the heart and to reassure what's going on. Another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُرْآنًا فَرَقْنَاهُ لِتَقْرَأَهُ عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى مُكْثٍ وَنَزَّلْنَاهُ تَنْزِيلًا He says, and it is a Qur'an, which we have separated by intervals, that you might recite it to the people over a prolonged period, and we have sent it down progressively, meaning it's piece by piece. Okay? It's not all at once. This is the point. This, this verse is in Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you recite it slowly to the people. 
the Quran is revealed slowly to the people. You can't give them a lot of Quran all at once, because then they won't accept it, they won't internalize it, they won't understand it. So even us, when we learn the Quran, we should try to take it slowly. We're not in a hurry. We have time, inshaAllah ta'ala. And even if we don't, we have that intention that we will finish the Quran. Khalas. If your intention is pure and honest, Allah will give you the reward. So even if you never actually finish memorizing and understanding and applying the Quran, if that is your sincere intention and you do actions that prove it, Allah will reward you for that. So we shouldn't forget yani, the element of intentions when doing these types of deeds. Okay? I had a little, yani, when I was preparing for this, for the people who know what binge watching is, does anybody, does anybody know what this is, binge watching? Have any, has anybody heard this term before? Binge watching? Okay. If you haven't, Alhamdulillah, Allah has protected you. <laughs> so it's the difference, binge watching with all these streaming services online like Netflix um, and Amazon and there's these shows and documentary series and movies. A person can sit on a show and it says there are seven seasons available. Start with season one and then you just finish 12 episodes in one sitting. You know what I mean? You start, it's dhuhr, and then you're like, wow, it's already fajr the next day? Where did my time go? I haven't even... <laughs> I'm in season three? Whoa! You know, and then, of course, alhamdulillah, yani, I'm not saying that I do this. You have to pray at least, right? <laughs> and do other things. But there are a lot of people, even non-Muslims, who are saying that doing things like this makes it so that you don't often recall. If you ask a person who binge-watched a show, what happened in season one, he'll be like, I have no idea. I don't remember what happened. Yeah, in the last episode, I'm just watching, right? They're just there watching. And it's the same effect with us with the Qur'an. Imagine if the Qur'an was given to us all at once, yeah, as Muslims, yeah, we would deal with it the same way. Meaning, a lot of it would be lost on us. We wouldn't perhaps internalize much of what's in there, and so on and so forth. And this is why there are a lot of TV services that when they put episodes, they put once a week in order to create anticipation and in order to create interest and intrigue, and in order for people to truly internalize each episode. You take that one episode for an hour, and then you're good for another week. And then we'll give you another episode, you're good for a week. And so, yani, if you follow this wisdom, then the Qur'an actually makes sense, and a person shouldn't binge watch. But that's a whole different subject, right? <laughs> okay, yes? Yes, he did. And the Torah. The Torah was revealed all at one time. But the Torah was different. Why? The Torah was mainly rules and regulations. It didn't have a lot of the eloquence or the story element or some of the other things that the Qur'an had. Plus, there wasn't a, div a difference in time. The Torah wasn't revealed at the time of Fir'aun. It was revealed after Fir'aun had perished. He's gone. Yani they had already defeated, they went through all of that stuff. Now Bani Israel are living on their own, so it's as if it's only meant for the Mecca, I'm sorry, the Madani period in that sense. Where the Torah is resembling the Madani parts of the Quran, some parts of it even, not all of it. Does that make sense? And so there's no need for that graduality. Khalas, here's the law, everybody's good. Plus Allah showed them miracles to increase their iman, to do all these things, which is why it was perfect for them. Bani Israel to receive it all at once. Whereas for the Muslims and Prophet Muhammad and his Sahaba, this was the ideal way. Barakallah fikum, jazakumullah khayran. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa, nastaghfiruka wa natubu